Okay, hello everyone. Um, we are having our 2021 Winter Salt Watch kickoff. It's so great to have many returning participants and also new participants. Um, I'm really excited about the panelists we have with us today. Um, Sally and Allison, could you turn on your cameras just for a second so folks could see you? Thank you. Okay, so with us today, uh, just to introduce myself, if you're not familiar with me, I'm Emily Bialowis. Um, I am the Chesapeake Monitoring Outreach Coordinator at the Isaac Walton League, but I moonlight as our Salt Watch Coordinator with our Clean Water Team. Um, we also have Allison Madison, who is the coordinator for Wisconsin Saltwise, and Sally Petrella. I don't know what your role is at Friends of the Rouge, but I think you are also a program coordinator there. Um, so how we're gonna go through today, um, I'm gonna, you know, give an overview of Saltwatch and give some updates as, about the data that you've contributed to us so far. Um, then we're going to hear from Sally ab about what it's like to participate in Saltwatch as a partner organization and how Friends of the Rouge chooses to facilitate Saltwatch in their community. And then we're going to hear from Allison about actually taking, you know, what you're excited about, what you've learned about um, as far as chloride impact in your waterways and to hopefully do something about it in your community. And then I'm gonna ask that we save our questions to the end. So you can see in your go-to webinar menu that you have a questions tab or a chat. I'm not sure what you see, but I'll be able to read both of those. And at the end of all three of our presentations, um, we can answer your questions, respond to any comments, um, and I look forward to that. Feel free to type into the chat while we're talking, but we're just not going to get to your questions till the end. Okay. I am going to start. Do you guys see my slides? All my slides? Okay. So Winter Salt Watch, if you're not familiar, um, we have been doing this program. This is our fifth year, it's our fourth full year. Um, the goal of this program, we want to raise awareness in the general public about the connection between salt and stream health. Um, we want to identify chloride hotspots in fresh water. And we want to advocate for a smarter application of road salt by sharing results with private landowners and local and state agencies. Um, we also, you know, this has, is a program that's grown really organically. It started with us seeing a pile of salt that seemed like too much. And we saw that it was directly affecting uh, the stream next to it. And um, it's really grown a lot. And that's only been with the help of our participants, many of whom are here today. So just some impacts. Why is it bad that salt gets into our waterways? Um, there are definitely wildlife impacts. It can affect fish, um, but macroinvertebrates, um, if you're familiar with the Save Our Streams program at the Isaac Walton League, we are very focused on macroinvertebrates. So macroinvertebrates that live in the bottom of the streams, and then even smaller plankton and microbes can be quite sensitive to uh, high chloride levels. Vernal pools where things like frogs and salamanders might be spawning um, can be really intensely affected because it's just a small um, ephemeral pool that only shows up every so often. And then also mammals drinking from highly chloride streams um, can be negatively impacted. That's like us, we are mammals. Uh, moving to drinking water impacts, you might know that you have 
chlorine in your water to disinfect your water, but chloride is different. Um, chlorides are not typically removed at water treatment plants due to the high cost. And another point, not only are they not removed from water treatment plants, once they're in the water, you know, the water in our stream, in our lake, in our groundwater, it's really hard to remove. And then also in severe cases, salts can corrode pipes, leaching heavy metals like lead into drinking water. So I'm not saying if you find high chloride in your, in your streams, you know, you should sound the alarm that you have lead in your water, but that is um, a potential down the road impact. It's also important for us to think about different chloride sources. This program, since it did grow and start pretty organically with us seeing a pile of road salt, um, we have been quite focused on road salt application. Um, we call it winter salt watch because we're focused on the winter season. And also that's when we think people can get excited about winter salt watch because they can see the salt that's on the ground and see that there's an impact on their local waterways that are right next to where salt was applied. Um, but chloride can also come from other sources. Uh, if you have a water softener, it's likely that salts are being used in those systems. And every time that water is going down the drain, it's taking salt with it. And there's also fertilizer runoff. Uh, potassium chloride is a common fertilizer. Um, one more is uh, gravel road suppressant, but that, again, all of these depend on where you live. So getting to the SaltWatch program, if you sign up for SaltWatch on our website, you get a kit in the mail, or if you sign up as a partner, we will send you a box of kits. Um, and a kit comes in a standard envelope, and it has these items in it. Uh, it has four strips, uh, which measure 30 to 600 parts per million chloride. Um, we have sample testing instructions. We have data uploading instructions with Water Reporter. And we have a conversion chart so that you're able to read your strips. The conversion chart is really important because the strips are made in different batches. So you have to hold on to your chart because it goes with the strips that you ordered. So if we send you a new kit later, you should use the chart that comes with your new kit. So we say volunteers should monitor. Again, we're focusing on the road salt application. We think volunteers should monitor before any winter storms happen. So at least where we live, where I live in the DC area, um, we haven't seen any snow yet, uh, to get a baseline reading uh, after salt has been applied and then again after the first warm day or rainstorm following a snow or freeze and then we say sometime in the spring after there's another rain event that's with the four strips you're given if you're really gung-ho and you use your strips at more than one location um, we can send you another kit this is one of the one of the cards you get in your kit how to participate um, the key here is that you have a smartphone and you download Water Reporter to your phone. These are the very easy to follow steps um, in using Water Reporter. And we are making a new video of how to use Water Reporter, but I also, I don't know if Sally wants me to share this, but Sally made a really great video of um, using Water Reporter to upload your data. And if you don't have a smartphone, um, you know, you can always email us your results um, at the location you're at. But smartphone, many people have them, should be easy enough to use Water Reporter. This is a very well done Water Reporter post. Um, someone took the picture of their conversion chart, which is necessary with their strip. Um, so I can read the strip, I can read the conversion chart. You know, we are compiling the data, so we need to be able to read all of that. Uh, put pertinent information in the comments, and they're, they're at their stream location, so I know that when I look at where this 
point is geolocated to that it'll be in the right spot. Again, if you think it's in the wrong spot, you can email us and let us know where the right spot is supposed to be. I just wanted to take this moment to plug our partnerships. We would not be anywhere with this program without partner organizations. Um, the map on the right is, you know, our unofficial partners from the last years. Um, those include schools, Isaac Walton League chapters, and many watershed organizations. Um, and then this year we've been formalizing those partnerships. So if folks, you know, want to have some event with us or they want to, you know, get a set of bulk kits and then have some event where they work with their volunteers, um, it might be in their best interest to become a SaltWatch partner. These are just the folks on the left who are our SaltWatch partners on our website so far. Um, but I know I know there are more than just what we officially have here. And then I just wanted to share some results. So we have at this point three full years of data. Um, you know, we started this in 2018. And um, you can see here there's a lot of green, but there are also some some red spots that poke through. The red are those places that are high over the toxic threshold for fluoride levels. So, you know, like I said at the beginning, we're using this program to identify hot spots. And even those places that have a green dot, um, you know, zero to 100, that is where we can't necessarily say that a waterway, if we're generalizing, we can't say it's definitely above natural levels. But folks um, at the local level, they might know that their lake has always been, had no salt in it. And now they're finding higher levels of 15 or 20 parts per million chloride. Um, and that is a worrying trend because as I mentioned at the beginning, once chloride is somewhere, it's really hard to get out. This is what I was just talking about. Um, on our strips that we use, we can't really detect below approximately 30 parts per million. So we start there. Um, and then, like I said, depending on the geology of where you are, there may be natural chloride or not. Um, and one second. Um, I, I can't see my screen now. There we go. Um, and then above 100 parts per million, we consider above natural background chloride levels. And then 230 is the EPA and also likely your state because states often follow EPA guidelines. Uh, 230 parts per million is the chronic exposure level to chlorides. Um, that's where aquatic life are affected and we begin to see mortality. Um, I have some questions as to what chronic means, but I think it's, you know, an exposure of several days to weeks. Um, and the, the threshold for um, acute toxicity, which would mean, you know, one-time exposure is 860 parts per million. We extrapolate sometimes with, you know, if something goes off the whole strip, that that's what we've hit, but our strips only go to about 600, 630 parts per million. So we can't exactly claim that. And then I just wanted to show you the power of, um, you know, partners all monitoring in the same community. So these are the results of the data from the Twin Cities for the last few years. Um, there's a transparency filter on. So if there's if it's less transparent, we just have more results there. But you can see that uh, these are these are by watershed, that about nine, ten of these watersheds are above that 230 parts per million in the average that we've seen. Um, and then it's really nice because we can also see where there's less of a problem and where it's better to focus. Um, 
this is the DC metro area. You can see there are some places we've had a lot of um, participation. Um, over here in particular, this is the Muddy Branch watershed. That's where our office is, and we have some great uh, local monitors with the um, with the Muddy Branch folks we work with. Um, but you can see here again where we have watersheds to focus on and watersheds where um, you know it might be slightly less of a problem. This is Philadelphia. I'm going to talk more about Philadelphia in a second. And here is the Detroit metro area, which um, Sally will share more with us about the Rouge watershed here. Um, and you can see here that, again, the watershed you're in, it might, um, you can see that there's high levels of chloride in some watersheds, and then right next to it, it's lower. So it's really, this is a highly um, local, localized issue. And making a change in your local watershed can really impact that. And then I just wanted to show this. Um, this is in the Phil greater Philadelphia metro area. And this is the first year they participated. I, I'm using Philadelphia because um, the folks from the uh, upper Philly cluster with the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, um, they adopted the Salt Watch program pretty early on. So we have good data with them for a long time. Uh, where you see a thicker border, that's where we have more data points. Um, and again, if it's darker, that's where there's higher chloride levels. So this is the first year. You can just see one watershed where it's um, that toxic level. This is the second year. Um, more that are of concern. And uh, actually, none of these are above the toxic level. Here, we have one above the toxic level and several that are of concern. And this is from the last year. We had a ton of participation. Um, I think COVID might have been an impact on that. Um, and you can see we have now a number of watersheds where we can identify that there are toxic fluoride levels. That might be because more people are monitoring. It might be because the year before was a mild winter and this year was not. Um, so if you find high chloride levels, and uh, Allison's gonna dive into this a little more, we do have Salt Watch advocacy resources on our webpage. This is uh, looking like an old version of our page, but it has resources so that you can learn more about the impact of chloride. Um, we have um, some flyers that you can hand out that are ad adapted not very much from the Wisconsin Saltwise folks. And we have letters that you can share with state representatives and local, local government to about why chloride is an issue and how you can make change in your community. So what you can do is keep monitoring and sharing your results, um, both sharing your results to us and Water Reporter and then you know, we send a newsletter once a month with our updated results. And you can share that with your community. You can tell neighbors and local businesses about smarter salt use, um, again, which we have information about on our website. And um, if you're working on your property to not be fooled by packaging that says eco or pet friendly, because you can read the ingredients on the side. Often, those are just sodium chloride, um, because there's nothing regulating what they can say on that packaging. And you should report over salting to your city or county. Um, it might take a little bit of back and forth to figure out who the right folks are. Feel free to ask us. Um, depending on where you are, it's different folks. You could try your Department of Transportation, uh, if your county or city is a Department of the Environment. Um, but it's good to tell someone that you're concerned because no one's gonna do anything if no one is complaining about it. And then you should order your salt watch kit, iwa.org slash saltwatch or just saltwatch.org. It'll bring you right to the page. Um, 
And if you want to become a partner uh, and you have more questions about that, or if you have any more questions in general, you can email us at saltwatch.iwa.org. Great. Um, next up, we're going to have Sally. Sally, would you like uh, me to give you the screen sharing? Sure, that'd be great. Show my screen, please choose Windows. Um, my maps, okay. Uh, now, now I'm not sure what you're seeing. Can you see my map? Can you see the map there? Yes. I can see the map, yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. And um, it's been a great experience to be part of this uh, Winter Saltwatch program. So I'm Sally Petrella. I'm a program manager. I'm actually the monitoring manager at Friends of the Rouge. And just a little background on Friends of the Rouge. We are a nonprofit organization that's been around for 35 years working on the Rouge River watershed. So I put it up on a map here for you to see. It's, um, it's a medium-sized watershed. And um, let me zoom in a little bit here. Uh, 467 square miles. Um, and uh, it's got a population of 1.3 million. And it's, it's a mix of residential and industrial with a small amount of agriculture. It's, it's really the most urbanized watershed in the state and um, has a long history of being one of the most polluted water bodies. Uh, the river has a long industrial history that, that peaked when, when Henry Ford decided to locate his factory in the banks of the Rouge River and in the 1920s. And that was back um, you know, before there was really any controls on pollution. You know, uh, dilution was the solution to pollution. So the river got so bad at one point that the surface of the river caught on fire because the river ran so thick with oil. So then, you know, 1970s, the passage of the Clean Water Act, the designation of the Rouge River as one of the Great Lakes areas of concern. And with massive amounts of federal, state, local funding, and the hard work of thousands and thousands of volunteers um, has led to a river that's now clean enough that we're really excited to be working on a water trail, of all things, to actually get people out there paddling. Um, but we're still you know, working on restoring the river. It still has a lot of problems. Uh, we've still got uncontrolled combined sewer overflows. Uh, polluted runoff. Um, you, I don't know. You know, I know people on this web webinar from all over, but uh, we experienced. Uh, I think it was eight major, major rain events this year. You know, one where we had seven inches in a in a couple of hours. Um, so major flooding that really highlighted some of the problems that we have. Um, and then, of course, uh, this problem of being an urban watershed and the continual paving over of, of the headwaters and much of the watershed that just makes the problems worse and worse. So, um, so I manage our volunteer monitoring programs, and we mainly focus on biological indicators. So Emily mentioned uh, the benthic macroinvertebrates. So we sample for bugs, we sample for fish. Uh, we also um, do calling surveys for frogs and toads um, and some other things. And we have a whole group of citizen scientists that are involved in doing this program. And um, I was contacted by Emily in 2019 asking if we would be interested in participating in Salt Watch. And one of the things that we do, uh, we do our benthic monitoring as group events. We have a spring bug hunt, we have a fall bug hunt, and then in the winter, we send volunteers to go out to the streams to look for stoneflies. It's a particular aquatic insect, insect that's very sensitive to water quality, and they hatch out in the wintertime. So this is actually one of our more popular events because it doesn't compete with a lot of things. What other opportunities do you have to go out in the snow and go look at the river and see what lives there? 
So when Emily contacted us, um, we thought that uh, this could be a great fit to add SaltWatch to the program where we already had volunteers going out to sites on the stream. For our events, we usually do 20 to 30 sites uh, throughout the watershed. Um, and I love the fact that SaltWatch just had these easy little test strips and even this app so volunteers could upload their data to the web. So, um, so we said, yes, let's, let's do it. And um, I'll show you our very first year, we went out there with those strips. And um, I'm not showing this by watershed like she was showing, but you've got um, the points there that we monitored. So we did uh, 20, let's see, 29 different sites. And um, we were actually alarmed that um, not quite half of the sites were high or even up in the, toxic range. Um, so what did we do with this? Well, we have strong relationships with the communities. We reported this to the communities. And then we also did a press release on this and the media picked us up, picked that up. And um, we were featured on the, no, the local news. My boss uh, got on there talking about road salt and its impact on the river. Um, and so, so we really got that information out there and this was a really helpful tool. Uh, the second year, uh, we, we surveyed again, and similarly, we had a winter where there was a lot uh, more snow, therefore more salt. So we had, we had much higher levels, and we also, uh, we had our citizen volunteers do this as part of our event, but we also offered this up if they wanted to do this on their own time um, on additional sites, and we also did some additional sites. We had um, more sites, uh, but but um, even higher results. So, you know, again, we put the results out and, and actually this time I, I got to be on the local news, um, say somehow in the winter time, they like to pick up this kind of story. It's a, it's a great way to get the word out. And um, I really tried to emphasize not so much alternatives to salt, but minimizing the use. They really wanted me to come up with products I would recommend. And that's kind of a hard one, kind of give the overall message that reducing your use is the most important thing. One of the questions that came up when we were showing this data to people who worked on the watershed is, well, was that right before a snow event? Was it right after a snow event? And unfortunately, the way we do our monitoring, we do it all in one day with a few additional sites. So we didn't really have the capacity to send people out to redo these sites based on before it snowed or after it snowed. And so we thought, well, why not, since we also do this monitoring in the spring and the fall, to uh, look at the baseline. And you would expect that fall would be a good time to look at the baseline. What is the natural level of chloride in these streams? But since we were doing spring too, we decided to add it in spring. So last spring, um, we went out there and surprise, surprise, uh, there were still pretty high residual levels. Um, I know in our area, we were experiencing a pretty severe drought. So I just don't think a lot of that got washed out. But one of the things we did is with our, not, not with the stoneflies, but with our spring and fall bug hunts, we actually calculate a score that, that translates to be poor, fair, excellent for the sites. And so we did a correlation looking at the bug scores versus the levels of salt. And there was a significant relationship between the, um, the lower scores and the higher levels of salt at the sites. So uh, that was spring, and then this fall, we went out there, we repeated it. I actually expected the levels to be much lower because of all the flooding, washing all that out. Um, but this, this whole program is helping us to pinpoint areas, start to look at, at watersheds, and um, just uh, help us to figure out, uh, because with the, with the bugs, there are so many different factors that influence those communities. They tell you a lot about the health of the stream and salt can be a contributing factor. So can a lot of other things. So this program is helping us to isolate that and we're gonna be diving deep down into it a little bit more. 
one of the things we found is that with our fish surveys, we have a particular sensitive fish called a stone cat that's in the main branch uh, along these sites, used to be found in the upper branch. And when you look at that, we are not finding it in the upper branch, which would be these sites. Um, and that particular branch has a very high level of salt. Um, so we're gonna kind of dive down into that. And then at the same time, another discovery that we made this fall is that uh, we found an endangered, uh, two, actually two listed species of freshwater mussels, which are particularly sensitive to high levels of salt, both of whom were out in the lower uh, reaches where the levels of salt are really low. So um, in closing, and I'm gonna stop showing my screen there, um, SaltWatch is a really convenient way that we can train citizen scientists to collect this data to better inform our biological monitoring and the health of the river. And we do plan to continue to monitor for road salt over time so we can understand the patterns and work to address the cause. It's a great partnership for us and thank you so much for letting us be a part of this. Thanks so much, Sally. I, I mean, it's it's great to hear your perspective on the data because you know I'm managing the data from over here, kind of at a much higher, you know, ten thousand foot view. So it's great to hear how how you can use it locally. Um, so thank you, and we'll see if folks, if you if you guys have any questions about what Sally just talked about. Make sure to put them in the questions box um, and we will get to it at the end of the session. So next up we have Allison. Allison, you still here? There she is. Yes. Um, and Allison's going to tell us about Wisconsin SaltWise and the next step of action, basically, of what you can do in your community. Two. At you sharing your screen one second, Allison. All right, thanks everybody. And yes, yeah, so my name is Allison Madison. I'm joining in from Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm going to talk about the work of Wisconsin SaltWise. So, Wisconsin SaltWise is a coalition of organizations, as you can see on the screen, working together to reduce salt pollution. And just this last year in 2021, we've really um, taken the work statewide before that saltwise started in the Dane County area. So some of the stories I'm going to tell you are about um, that earlier work. And then in 2021, we've been connecting with organizations, different counties, municipalities, watershed organizations across the state that are also concerned about the growing concentration of salt showing up in our fresh waterways as well as in our groundwater and our drinking water. And so together, um, and then thanks to Fund for Lake Michigan, we've gotten some, some dollars to help us work and, and do this work statewide. So kind of the foundational piece of Wisconsin SaltWise is providing training opportunities to anybody involved in winter maintenance. And so we have um, been able to offer smart salting workshops that were actually developed in Minnesota with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and Important Consulting. And so these classes in person, and then um, during the last couple of years, we've also been offering them virtually, are half day classes that give those winter maintenance professionals a foundation in salt pollution, the concentration um, criteria that um, criterium that we mentioned earlier, and also um, a number of best practices that can enable them to really significantly reduce salt use. So, because salt has been so cheap, you know, it's also a very effective de icer. Um, there's been a lot of push to just you know dump it down. Some is good, more is better, and we really need to make sure that the people who are driving those trucks understand that's that's not the case anymore. And also to help us, you know, the cost of salt is going up. So there are multiple factors here um, that are influencing behavior around salt use, especially at the municipal level. So um, one of the things, like I said, bringing people together for that basic training 
And another thing that we're doing is getting operators and superintendents foremen um, to talk to one another about what they're doing. So bringing in um, neighboring municipalities to the community shop of a particular municipality or a county that's been able to make significant salt reductions has been something that um, we've done we had done a little bit of before this year but um this fall held we're holding in total nine i think we've had six or seven right now i've got um, one tomorrow in the milwaukee area and then in lancaster on friday so these events have been really successful um dozens of operators coming together and just sharing those stories of best practices um brainstorming solutions to problems with, you know, what are we doing when temperatures are really cold? Are you, you know, is this plow blade working for you? I've seen it, you know, out there, but it's really expensive. Like, um, I think, you know, facilitating those conversations is gonna really help um, obviously this winter, but I think kind of going forward, if we can continue to, to get communities to kind of break those silos down and talk to one another more. And I wanted to share, so what are like, what are some of those success stories that we've seen? So Cudahy is a community um, in the Milwaukee metropolitan area, and they calibrated their equipment several years ago, and just through calibration alone, were able to reduce their salt use by 50%, <laughs> which is just crazy that, you know, we have these trucks, they're going out there, but if they aren't calibrated, operators um, don't really know how much salt they're putting down and you're in the back of us you know you're in a snowstorm you can't really necessarily look back at the truck and figure out you know how much salt is coming down on that snowy road so making sure that the equipment is calibrated at least annually if not more um, can lead to some significant changes without you know any sort of investment in new equipment um, but that is another way that we've been able to see a lot of reductions in total salt use is by moving from straight rock salt to the incorporation of brine. So salt brine can be added to rock salt before the rock salt is applied to pavement. And that helps the that solid rock salt stick and stay on the pavement and not bounce off. Um, some DOT studies have determined that about 30% of rock salt is just gonna bounce off the street and not be effective as a de-icer and just go, you know, pollute our waters. And so by adding that brine, we can keep the salt where we need it to be and, you know, reduce costs, reduce pollution. Um, brine can also be used as anti-icing before the storm. So putting salt brine down before the storm works like putting oil on your skillet before you cook. So the spatula can come and scoop that food off or the plow blade can come and scoop um, the salt or the, excuse me, scoop the snow off. And so you're, you're just preventing that bond from forming and that can really reduce total salt use. So we've got some photos there of calibration. Here are a couple of pictures from the city of Middleton in the Madison area. And they were able to make some investments in their trucks. And you can see here, this is a pretty fancy like smart truck, which will um, prevent the problem that probably most of us have seen of you know little piles of salt near intersections where the truck salt truck has sat for maybe a minute before being able to make a turn so what these trucks do is that operators can set them to put down a specific amount of salt per lane mile so you can see maybe it's probably pretty small um up here in the photo in the the left top left 300 and this is pounds per lane mile so the, it's calibrated not only to put the 300 pounds per lane mile down at a set speed, but also if the truck slows down, then the salt auger will slow down and less salt will be put down um, per, you know, like, or I should say the same amount of salt will be put down um, per lane mile or per area. And so that's been really, really great um, because otherwise you know, we can't necessarily expect operators to know, okay, I'm slowing down now, let's you know crank it from three down to one. Okay, I'm speeding back up, crank it back up to three, I'm stopping, let's turn it down to zero. You know, they're operating giant vehicles, plowing, trying to avoid, you know, curbs and mailboxes and maybe someone who's darting around them quickly. So just trying to make it easier for operators. And those um, reductions or those, excuse me, equipment upgrades 
and the education and training of their staff enabled Middleton to reduce their salt use by 50% per storm. So these are not ins insignificant reductions. In addition to working with municipalities, we're also working with private companies, private winter maintenance companies and facilities managers from schools and universities and anybody who's gonna be maintaining private parking lots and sidewalks. So again, you can see here that liquid salt brine that they are gonna be applying kind of before the storm comes to do that anti-icing work it has enabled them to reduce salt use by 50% on all of those properties. So another thing SaltWise is doing, in addition to doing that education and training, is we want to be promoting all of these reductions and just, you know, the idea of reduction potential <laughs> for other communities. So um, talking about those municipal champions on our website, also giving them an opportunity to share their stories uh, with our monthly webinar series. So we've had one with private contractors. You can see in the bottom left here, we had a facilities manager from Mayo Clinic, which is based in Rochester, Minnesota, share about the amazing reductions that they've had at that um, clinic site. And um, we've got one coming up tomorrow, if anyone has time over the the lunch hour, this is a, a new, another noon webinar, but noon central time. And we have the deputy director from the Capital Area Regional Planning Commission talking about a chloride reduction project in the Madison area. So you know, just providing more platforms for people to be telling their stories of, of salt reduction, what's going on. And then of course, you know, trying to share the word out on social media. So we have the SaltWise shout out that we're using for you know, facilities managers, like you can see here, this is a casino just outside of Madison, and um, they are using some of that brine for anti-icing. They were able to cut their salt use down by 70%. It's just huge, right? The potential here. And I feel like we people need to know that this is possible because it's also enabling them to then cut down their salt bill. And then I also threw in here a salt wish shout out to um, Linnea Rock, who has done a lot of the monitoring that, um, all of you or many of you I'm assuming have. And she was doing that for some of her master's research at UW. So trying to share the stories of monitoring out there as well. So I think it's pretty clear to everybody, um, as Emily shared, you know, road salt, put it down, it's not staying on our roads, it's all making its way into our water. But I did wanna at least put a mention out there to water softener salt. So in Wisconsin, or southern Wisconsin, I should say, not necessarily all of northern Wisconsin, but southern, southeastern Wisconsin, we have very hard water. Our water sits in calcium, magnesium, carbonate, limestone. And um, when we're pulling that water up, both calcium, magnesium, and people use salt-based softeners to exchange those ions and soften the water, take care of hard water scale. But the wastewater treatment plants can't remove it. So all of that salt going into our streams in the winter, in the spring, in the summer, this is a year-round problem. So um, this is a, a map of Wisconsin where all the dark, dark blue is our really, really hard water um, areas. And then those orange circles are wastewater treatment plants that are discharging salty water into our streams. Water that's so salty that DNR, our state DNR knows that not good, but there's no good way to pull salt out of wastewater. It would take so much energy. It would be, you know, a, a carbon problem. So Instead, it's continuing to happen, and we're trying to raise awareness about that as well. So here we have some old water softeners that converted into buoys and put out in a lake, the saltiest of all the lakes in Madison. And we got some great coverage on that in our local, local paper. Worked with um, a local um, boat rental company to get those out there, and then also got on TV speaking about this issue. So we want people to understand that all those bags of salt are, are polluting our fresh water. So there are some um, options around water softening. We can get people to switch from a salt-based softener to a salt-free alternative. Those technologies are, just, it's not the conventional technology. I think there are people who will mark um, concern, you know, is this really gonna work? But I think it's, it, you know, it's time. <laughs> we need to um, begin to embrace these alternatives. And then something else that we can do, um, this is a photo from the basement of a really large apartment building 
in downtown Madison, and they have a huge, actually two huge water softeners. So the facilities manager there is collecting the discharge from the water softener, so salty water, instead of sending it down the drain, is collecting that and putting that on sidewalks to do that anti-icing in the winter. So pulling the salty water out of um, the wastewater stream and out of our freshwater streams, and then using it to do um, some of the, the better kind of known practices for winter parking lot and sidewalk maintenance. So pretty great story. So I'm getting out and about and telling those stories um, you, wherever I can, you know, feel a little um, impacted by COVID in terms of ability to do that. But um, we were at an event this summer and we had people printing little bandanas for their dogs and t-shirts to help, you know, spread the word about these freshwater organisms that are impacted by all of our salt use. So I want to just first thank everybody who is joining in on the call today. Um, there are, you know, obviously a lot of things you can do to be salt wise. And I'm making the assumption that a lot of you are at least somewhat involved in citizen science monitoring. So thank you for doing that um, and being out there and bringing this data in so we can understand the, the problem better. Of course, you can work to, you know, right size your personal salt use at home, whether it be winter salt use or looking at your water softeners. And I would direct you to our website if you want any. You know, information about that and also let you know that on our website we've got a ton of outreach materials. I know Emily said that you know the Isaac Walton League has modified some of them and if you work for another organization you'd be interested in taking our materials or modifying them just please do reach out and then um, yeah share our stuff on social media. It really helps to have more followers and more likes to continue to get the grant funding to do this work. Um, and then of course, you know, talking with folks about what you're doing and, and why you're passionate about this, why you care about this. So make sure you're telling your stories um, with others and telling the stories of these successes. Is, um, I feel like how we're going to um, work on this problem. So thanks for being a part of those solutions. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, we do have some questions. Before I get to that, I do just want to show uh, our website and the Wisconsin SaltWise website uh, where we have some resources. Can you guys see my screen? Here, you can see this. Um, so this is the Wisconsin SaltWise website. It has a lot of the information that um, Allison was just talking about. Um, and uh, really great background information over here, the skinny on salt, and um, a lot of the outreach she was talking about over here under take action. Um, that is, a lot of it is geared towards Wisconsin specifically. We have, um, this is our Salt Watch website. This is where you take the Salt Watch pledge um, and you can sign and you sign up for a kit here. Um, and you can see we have background information about best practices. Um, we have our results and under what you can do, um, this is what I was talking about, what you can do at home, um, how you can reach out in the local community. Um, and we have resources um, that are potentially tailored to your state if you are in one of the places where we have a lot of participation. Okay, we're gonna answer some questions now. Um, so just, I'm gonna answer some questions first just about uh, Salt Watch. Um, Radhika asked if there's a recommended time before or after storm events for sampling. I think if you can get before the salt is applied, like if, you, if there's something in the forecast and you think they're gonna put down salt uh, tonight, like Allison was saying, a lot bounces off the road. <laughs> So if you can get it before they're applying salt, that'd be great. And after, honestly, after the snow has hit the ground, a lot of salt has already run off. Um, so um, that's my recommendation. Um, if you're using Water Reporter, yes, follow us on Water Reporter is the same as joining the group. Okay, now we have some questions for Allison and Sally. Um, 
Sally, Michael asked you if you've seen any fish kills due to acute salt spills. Um, great question. Um, no, actually, we have not uh, from the salt. We do, we do have some natural fish die-offs. The uh, gizzard shad is a type of fish that's really sensitive to temperature change, and we actually oftentimes get a lot of phone calls from people like these fish are dying. It must be because the rouge is so polluted, and it doesn't really have to do with it. But, um, but no, we haven't seen any fish die-offs. But okay. I, uh, but but I guess my statement about the stone cat is that I think that we're missing certain types of fish and parts of the rouge because it's been this bad for this long. I understand that. Um, Allison, is there a list somewhere showing a summary of all best salting practices, not for local, not for you know residents, but for those large scale applicators that you work with? Yeah, I would direct people um, to our website and then the tab, um, actually maybe I can, if I pull it up right now, um, for winter maintenance professionals or winter maintenance professionals. And then we have all the resources that are out there in the chat, or excuse me, are, are gone over in the class. So I'll share. Yeah, so under winter or maintenance professionals, I guess is what it is right now. Um, we've got application guidelines and calculator resource, so people can choose, you know, a particular um, material that they're putting down. This is probably really small. Um, so if they are working with rock salt or um, rock salt with liquid blend, rock salt with brine, and I'll just go rock salt. And then choose like pavement temperature because you know salt isn't really effective when it's below 15 degrees. So um, and salt's more effective; it's going to melt um, faster if it's warmer. So you can get some application rate recommendations, and there's also more information about brine on there, um, different brush tools. Because sometimes we don't even necessarily need to like shovel and throw salt down; we can just brush the snow away and um, and then resources on calibration as well as if you want to just go under training resources we've got um, all of the handouts and the materials from the training class excellent thank you so much for that um, yeah, and I would say that like a lot of our resources are not just Wisconsin specific. Like we've got a lot of materials that are applicable for anybody, no matter where you are in the snow belt that's snowing or you know you're softening water. There are a lot of good materials. And we actually share some of the success stories. Like I mentioned, Mayo Clinic is in Rochester, Minnesota. We talk about more Minnesota stories, New Hampshire. Um, we're trying to really provide a platform with, you know, what's what are the best practices, what's being done, where are the best you know, successes uh, across the country. That's a great point. And also, like, behind the scenes, a lot of the folks who work on this, especially like state agencies, they're not really working on their own. You know, what's what's being success, what is successful somewhere is often being shared with other state agencies of what they can do, especially, you know, on on state roads and what, what they can do that way. Um, Speaking of which, yeah, I was actually in a call just before this one um, through the EPA with folks from Maryland and Ohio. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm in Wisconsin, so we're we're all trying to talk. So we aren't all just reinventing the wheel. Great. Um, Anthony asked, "What is brine, and wouldn't some run off into streams?" Um, Allison might be the best to answer this. The brine is basically salt suspended in water. Um, Yep, it's a 23.3% solution of salt in water. So it's salt water. And um, yes, that salt is all still headed. Like all the salt we put down on the roads, it's all going into our water eventually, right? And um, maybe um, directly, <laughs> you know, if, if salt goes down and snow goes down and gets dumped um, or, you know, like plowed off into a stream. Um, or maybe it's infiltrating through groundwater, that brine salt, the salt in the brine is going into our water as well. But it's just that we're able to really significantly cut the total amount of salt 
that's needed um, when we're using brine. So um, like I said, brine, it's, it's less than a quarter salt by volume and you can just use it much more effectively. It's like imagining, um, imagine having like, um, what is it like Pam, right? Those little like sprays, you can put down like a tiny bit of like oil, right? On your fry pan before you cook versus um, cooking, you know, and then like putting like tablespoons of butter down um, to try to like loosen something up. Thanks. Um, one more person asked if the slide deck will be available. You can email me, saltwatch at iwa.org if you have any questions after this. Um, and this is also all being recorded on our website. Um, Bill also asked, do you see local and state governments using your saltwatch data? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, our goal with saltwatch is mostly raising awareness um and then you know working with partners to try to make change in their community um someone who's been asking a lot of questions on here is michael from gaithersburg in maryland we have a gaithersburg salt watch program with him um and that is somewhere where we're going to be um you know really focusing on what it takes to make a community to uh become aware of their salt use and what can what changes can be made at the local level um and then i will say last year we worked with the minnesota pollution control agency um to try to get salt watch kits out into places where there are fewer people so maybe they don't have as much monitoring around there and getting people to monitor in lakes where it's the pollution control agency couldn't get to so like basically using salt watch monitors as screeners for chloride hotspots. So it's different everywhere, but um, the answer is, yeah. <laughs> not, not, they're using our data or they are, you know, using us as a tool for raising awareness around this issue. Um, I had one, sorry, it's hard to do this. Sally. In an urban area, are homeowners and businesses receptive to using screen-friendly materials for DIC? That's that's a really good question, um, and and I was even going to ask Allison that um, you know just about the communities and whether some communities embrace your message and other ones don't even want to hear it, um, because we I know that. Um, there's this fight against, we want to keep people really, really safe. We don't want any chance that they might get harmed by slipping on our property, break a leg and then sue us. And some of the communities have had a lot of problems with lawsuits. So there's, there's a bit of uh, resistance there. Um, so no, I wouldn't say that the message is universally embraced. Um, and then I guess uh, my perception, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but our watershed is really split between a very wealthy county and a very not so wealthy county. And the wealthy county has the resources to buy the fancy equipment that will do these things. Some of the other counties barely have enough funding to pay for the salt to get it out on the road. So they're just pouring the road salt out there. So that's a big, um, that's a big thing that it would be nice if there were grants out there also that recognize the limited resources of some communities versus other communities. A lot of these grants that they have for things like this require a match. And if your community doesn't have the resources to come up with a match or the people, um, they're never gonna be able to get the funding to do this. I guess I'm tossing that one back at you, but yeah, no, it's not across <laughs> the board that people really wanna hear this message. Um, yeah. And uh, I know the reporter really pushed me to, and I was even talking about vinegar and water, which I tried, and honestly, it doesn't really work very well. But um, they really wanted to I push. I mean, a lot of alternatives. They might be less effective. They might be, but they're almost always more expensive. Yeah, and I feel like the bottom line is there is no silver bullet. There is no like yeah. environmentally safe thing to put down, right? It's all going into our water. So sand has a sedimentation, right, and it's changing habitat. Um, and salt, you know, you have the chloride toxicity issue. And I mean, 
like the next thing we put down, some people want to say beet juice. I mean, that's an organic material. And so it goes into the water and microbes eat that up, eat up those sugars, and they are also pulling oxygen out as they do it. So exactly. really what exactly. the salt waste message is like, we need to be smart about this. Like whatever we're doing, right? We should have as many tools in our tool belt as possible to like kind of a, go at the storm, um, but be, to be smart about it, to be salt wise. And we're not saying like, we need to really reduce our level of service. And actually what most communities are saying is we're gonna maintain our level of service, but do it with less salt because we're gonna do it better in a better way. Um, and I think that's like kind of the biggest message where we're at right now maybe down the line if we really do want to value our water is we're going to have to lower expectations right and maybe people don't drive to target in the middle of the snowstorm to buy that thing you really need to have right like people used to stay home a little bit more you have to wait until the you know the roads get cleared um and i think right now we just have this expectation of convenience and you know deserving to get wherever we want to go whenever we want to go at pretty much top speed. Yeah, I'm trying to remember who was talking about this. I've attended a lot of presentations about salt <laughs> in the last few years uh, for this position. Um, but someone was talking about how, you know, the number miles of roads have only increased so much, but the rate of how much salt has been applied uh, is a much higher rate than that. So we put down more salt per road mile than we used to is the point um, mm -hmm. and a lot of that like allison said is because of expectation folks didn't necessarily expect to be able to get out of the house and they didn't all they didn't always expect a totally clear dry road on the highway when they got there during a storm so there's that um i do just want to answer this question about guidelines for choosing a site and you know where you should sample we started this program in, you know, weightable streams and rivers. Um, we do also have some guidelines for lakes um, that requires trying to get a little further into the water than just the shoreline. Um, but we can do this in lakes and streams. We don't currently, and I don't know how we would, so we're not, we don't do groundwater, but, um, you know, Stream, stream in particular, um, that's a pretty good sense of how our groundwater is doing. So um, that's what I have to say. Thank you so much to Sally and Allison for joining us. If there were any questions that you still had, you can email me at saltwatch at iwa.org and um, I'll pass your questions along to Allison and Sally. Um, and I'm so glad to have everyone on board for Salt Watch this year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everybody.